Um, I've got to introduce you properly, but I want to tell you how much I appreciate your participation in this. And I remember oh, no. a phone call when we had, uh, we talked to you several months ago, I think it was right before the pandemic. Yes. And you said, this is exactly the type of things that we want to highlight. And so I appreciate your leadership on that and making your team available. And uh, I've gotten That's to know Dr. Team. Hayden through the Library of Congress, which is one of our favorite uh, buildings and we're big supporters of that whole program because of what it represents in knowledge and the programs that they put on and she has got a very successful <laughs> career and uh, you know when you look at this uh, she was the CEO of Enoch Pratt uh, Free Library in Baltimore Maryland president of the American Library Association um, in 2020 she was elected to the American Philosophical Society She's a fellow Floridian, was born in Tallahassee, and um, went on to become educated, got her master's in library science and on to a PhD. And, um, you know, she was around the Library of Congress occasionally uh, before um, she was nominated by um, Barack and Michelle Obama. And she was sworn in July 13th of 2016 and is the first, not just female, Librarian of Congress, but the first black woman to hold this uh, position. And uh, I've gotten to know you pretty well through the uh, David Rubenstein uh, 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 Congressional Nights. And, um, you know, we have such pride and admiration for the Library of Congress for what it does. And so with that, I want to uh, just turn the floor over to you because I know you've got a very tight schedule. And I look forward to working with you to bring this dream of Miss Lizzie Jenkins to fruition yeah. to help get the museum um, of the Rosewood uh, uh, tragedy to light so that our young people can learn from this and all people of all races will say, let's not repeat these mistakes. So thank you and I'll turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Congressman Yoho, because I'm pleased to be here, mainly because the Library of Congress exists to preserve moments and history like Rosewood. And you're right, we need to have hope in history and sometimes it's difficult history and we need to remember and learn and try to help us understand our present. And so we gain inspiration from the acts of people who are not too different from ourselves and we discover their strength and resolve. And so the Library of Congress is the nation's library. It serves Congress. Uh, but it also serves the people that Congress serves. And the African-American history collection at the Library of Congress reaches across all formats and reading rooms. The Library of Congress is the world's largest library. And the African-American collection is massive, it's impressive, and most of it is available online for everyone to explore. And I just want to give a sense of some of the things. We have the papers and diaries and personal correspondence of Frederick Douglass, Mary Church Terrell, Jackie Robinson, Rosa Parks with an online exhibit of, in her own words, of her own writings, Thurgood Marshall, and also organizations like the NAACP, uh, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee, we also have a civil rights history project and oral histories, photographs, former slave narratives, chronicling America, newspapers, maps, music, sound recordings, film, documentaries, dance, Catherine Dunham, the Alvin Ailey uh, archive. And so you see that this effort to continue to chronicle African-American history is a major part of what the library does. All of these materials though would just be stagnant if you didn't have the dedicated staff members who give their careers and lives to making this history come alive. And we're very fortunate that Miss Adrian Cannon is the library's African-American history and civil rights expert. 
She oversees the records of the NAACP, for instance. She curated our exhibit on Rosa Parks. But also, and everyone listening, I just have to tell you, this is the part that I love uh, revealing. She is a descendant of Carter G. Woodson, the historian and the author whose lifelong advocacy uh, for African-American history led to the creation of what we now call Black History Month. And so we're very pleased to be part of this effort to make sure that the history and the lessons of Rosewood are not forgotten. And so I'm going to turn it over to Adrian to give you a sense of what the Library of Congress has that relates to the Rosewood uh, history. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, the library recently acquired the, the Chronicling America uh, project from the newspaper and current periodicals reading room, which is an online initiative. And that can be searched to access several issues, contemporary issues that document the Rosewood Massacre. And we also have throughout our general collections, books that are published on the uh, Rosewood Massacre that can be accessed through the online catalog. And, uh, books that are also represented at, at libraries in Florida and across the United States. I appreciate that and uh, I thank you for the work that you're doing along with the Library of Congress. I can't say enough about those. Um, what I'd like to do is go ahead and, and um, uh, introduce our other um, uh, panelists and speakers. Um, I'm gonna save Miss Lizzie Jenkins for the end. Uh, Dr. Maxine Jones, um, we're honored to have you here. You received your BA and PhD from Florida State University, that, that other university in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the only university in Florida. <laughs> I know, and it's a great one. I love our team sports. Uh, she is the co-author of two books, African American in Florida, uh, who she wrote with uh, Kevin McCarthy, not uh, the House Minority Leader, um, and uh, ta and uh, the first century, um, the first century with Joe Richardson, African Americans in Florida received the Charleston W. Tebow Book Prize from the Florida Historical Society. Professor Jones was the principal author of a report on the Rosewood incident for the Florida legislation. And I thank you for you participating in here and I look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. So Fanny Taylor's screams on the morning of January 1st, 1923, shattered the peace of several Levy uh, County uh, communities. Taylor's subsequent uh, charges of being attacked by a black man set in motion a chain of events that by the end of the week had resulted in at least eight deaths and the destruction of a town called Rosewood. Governor Kerry Hardee ordered a special grand jury investigation on January 29th. A grand jury met in February, but found insufficient evidence to prosecute. No charges were ever brought by the state of Florida against any person for the alleged assault on Francis Taylor, for the killing of Sam Carter, for the deaths occurring at the, uh, at the carrier home on the night of January 4th for the deaths of Lex Lexi Gordon, James Carrier, or Mingo Williams, or for any acts of arson and theft which occurred at Rosewood, Florida. The lives of Rosewood's residents were permanently scarred as they were forever held uh, prisoner by their memories of that week of terror. The trauma from those memories became, became intergenerational as survivors raised their children in an environment of silence and fear. But the children of those survivors, which included uh, the Carriers, the Goings, the Bradleys, the Halls, the Edwards, uh, the Carters, and others, 
refused to live in silence and fear that had trapped their parents. They brought that week of terror to the attention of the state in 1993. And with the help of Holland and Knight and Steve Hanlon and Martha Barnett, the state of Florida finally acknowledged the week of terror in May 1994 when Governor Lawton Child signed an approximately $2.1 million compensation bill into law. Before, before affixing his signature to the controversial measure, Governor Childs asserted, ignorance and hatred, in, uh, ignorance and hatred, ignorance and racial hatred can lead to death and destruction. Let us use the lesson of Rosewood to promote uh, healing. In June of 2004, Governor uh, Jeb Bush dedicated a historical marker in Rosewood documenting as well as, commemor as commemorating uh, the incident. The state of Florida holds the distinction of being the first state to formally acknowledge uh, the racial terror uh, committed against its black citizens and to award financial compensation. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate your comments and uh, the research and your passion about what you've done. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Stephen Hanlon, um, who has a very, very uh, colorful past and has done a lot. He uh, professor of practice at the St. Louis University of School and um, was a partner at Holland and, and Knight, as you mentioned. And I think the thing that really impressed me is the work you've done on the public pro bono part where you've had the largest full-time practice of pro bono department in the nation. And um, what it exemplifies to me is that you're out there working for people that are outside the legal system that need help and that um, you just take on these cases. And um, you did this for 23 years and your work on the civil rights and just social justice and things like that are so important because we know so many people and it gets where it doesn't, it goes beyond race. There's so many people that are excluded from the legal system and I appreciate what you've done and what you've stood for. And so I'd like to hear a few, you know, your comments and then we'll go in uh, and introduce uh, Miss Amy Johnson and then Miss Lizzie Jenkins. Well, thank you, Congressman. Um, I thought it might be helpful to start with, how did we decide to take this case? Uh, at sure. Uh, Holland and Knight. Uh, because this was a 70-year-old case, and my partners were saying, well, surely there must be something more current uh, that is a concern for African-Americans uh, in Florida. Um, I, um, Senator Bill uh, Bradley, the former Senator Bill Bradley, has a wonderful question that he asks Americans, and that, that question is this. When was the last time you had a serious conversation about race with a member of another race? I'm very fortunate then that I, I counted among my African-American friends, the president of the Tampa Chamber of Commerce, Israel Tribble. So I sat down to talk with him to discuss this issue. And when I told Ike the story of Rosewood, he had tears in his eyes. And he immediately told me, you've got to take that case. And I asked him why. And he said, Steve, my daddy died before my mama died. And then my mama died. And then I went to my mom's funeral. And when I came back from my mama's funeral, the only thing I had was a bill for the funeral. And that's not going to happen to you, Steve. And that's why you've got to take this case. Ike was trying to describe to me the problem of the intergenerational transfer of wealth for African Americans in our country. And Rosewood was a powerful story about the historic inability of African Americans in this country to acquire capital in one generation, hold that capital, and pass that capital along intact to the next generation. And that, in my view, is the significance of the Rosewood case. And that is why Rosewood has had such a powerful impact on the African-American community in Florida. I like to think of Rosewood as Reparations 101, okay? It was the first time, okay? Um, what are its lessons, okay? I think the primary lesson 
okay, is the role of history uh, embodied in the great work uh, that Maxine Jones did uh, with all of her team and uh, all of the other professors. Um, as we are learning today, we are a nation in many ways without a common history. It's a hard way to be a nation. Okay? The two different versions of what happened, okay? And we're now learning in a more full, full uh, in a fuller way, uh, the part of that story that has never really been told or understood. And if you don't know the story, you can't understand the story and you can't learn uh, from uh, the story. The other part of the, the Rosewood lesson, I think, is the role of education. Uh, I think those scholarships uh, and the role of overcoming uh, some of those past uh, legacies uh, through education was quite important. And uh, it brings us to a point where we are today, where we, the country, I think, is longing for solutions longing for a way to end this generational cycle, trying to figure out what has happened, trying to educate our citizens about what has happened, and trying to find some remedy coming out of that. There are enormous, from my point of view, legal obstacles to doing that right now under the current situation, let's put it that way. And this is going to be a very difficult thing to find out, but I think we are going to delve into our history and try and find if we can't come up with a common view of what actually happened. Well, I appreciate those comments and there are so many, there are so many lessons to learn on that. And again, my whole thing is we don't want to make these mistakes, but yet Today in the world, you know, I sit on foreign affairs and so I'm very tuned to what's going on in like the Asia Pacific. And I see nations like China trying to cancel cultures like the uh, Muslim Uyghurs, the East Turkestans, or the Tibetans to erase them from history. You can erase them, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so what's going to happen is in the future, those same conflicts will happen again. And that's why I think it's so important to have this. We're honored also to have with us uh, Miss Amy Johnson. She was appointed state librarian and director of the Division of Library Information Services at the Florida Department of State. Uh, since joining the division in 2000, Miss Johnson has held several positions, including grant coordinator. Uh, I know Lizzie's gonna talk to you after this, state, <laughs> state data coordinator and chief bureau of the library uh, development. Ms. Johnson completed her master's of science and library science degree at Florida State University. And then she completed her undergraduate education at the University of, uh, of, the, of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. And so uh, Ms. Johnson, if you have uh, some comments you'd like to make. Congressman, she's not jumping on until 1230, so I'm sorry. Oh, okay. My mistake, that's Jessica. And so next, we'll go to Miss Lizzie Jenkins. And like I said uh, previously, she is a force. And I've got to know Lizzie very well over the course of the last, since my tenure in Congress, I entered office in 2013. And the thing I, I, I respect and admire about Lizzie is she'll make you measure up. She'll hold you accountable. She'll challenge you. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, we may be different philosophically in, uh, in maybe political uh, ideologies, but I don't think we're that far apart. But she, she's very forthright, open, and honest. And that's the thing that I really appreciate about her. And when she approached me about this, you could see the passion in her eye and in her spirit. And it was exemplified by the book she wrote. And she talks she just doesn't walk the walk, she talks the talk. And I re really mean that, we hear that as a cliche, but she has been actively progress uh, promoting this and progressing this movement forward. Uh, and that's why we're on the call today. And so Lizzie, if you wanna give your um, uh, take of this and what this means, not just to the community of Archer or Levy County, <coughs> uh, but just to the, the generation at hand, and moving forward with that generation so that they know about this story. And so Miss Lizzie Jenkins, I turn the floor over to you. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I'm clear. Okay. As, he, as Congressman Yoho said, my name is Lizzie Robinson Jenkins. I'm the president and founder of the Real Rosewood Foundation, Inc., which was established in 2003. And the reason I named it the Real Rosewood Foundation is because my information is real. It's research. It's the truth. I am also co-founder of the Rosewood Heritage Foundation, Inc., which was established in 1995 with Rosewood descendants, Dr. Annette Goings Shakir, Miss Gretchen Douglas, and Miss Janie Blight. I'm a retired educator, historian, and a fourth generation storyteller. I'm honored to share my 28 year journey of Rosewood history that invaded my childhood at age five in 1943. The narrative of this horrific story told to me by my mother shaped my life and left a lifelong passion in my spirit. Her sister, Mahalda Gussie Brown Carrier was the third Rosewood school teacher from 1915 to 1923. Her life was ruined because of the hateful attacks on her body during the 1923 Rosewood massacre. She never forgave her attackers and she never forgot them. My mother inherited her sister's conflict and pass them forward to me. Here I am today, September 28, 2020, still working to change the narrative of a 98-year-old story. And I appreciate Congressman Ted Yoho so very much. Mom's 1943 story of her sister's inaptitude is why I am a guest today on this Library of Congress Rosewood Zoom meeting. Mom's reflection of her sister's pain was serious and fearful. Because of mom's sadness and fear, I was left feeling sad and fearful too. As a five-year-old child, and the night after the story, I wanted to hear more. But before her story ended, I dropped off to sleep. It was at night. But I knew when I got up the next morning, I wanted to hear more. But at breakfast with the family was not the right time. So I went to school that day, and I could not think of anything else. But my favorite aunt being attacked. And it was 1943, and I was thinking, I could not conceive of the time element. So I was thinking it happened last night, like in 1943. However, it had happened 20 years earlier. So I took the Rosewood story to school daily because I could not let go of it at age five. Mom was unhappy about her sister's life taking a sudden turn for the worse. We continued our Rosewood talks over the years, just the two of us. And mom's marching orders to me, as long as she lived, you must remember your history and keep the leg in our legacy. You must research, authenticate, document, and tell Rosewood's truth. Never attack anyone about a history they did not create. Just tell the truth, baby. Leaving home for college, I became a member of the Divine Nine in Zetadom. Mm -hmm. I took my Rosewood story to my NBC in St. Augustine, Florida, 1960. I joined the NAACP as a junior, participating in the 1960 Civil Rights Lunch Counter sit-in at the W.F. Woodworth store. Today, my fight for justice, truth, and reconciliation continue because of my Rosewood experiences. 
And I'm not going to go into details about Fanny Taylor because Dr. Maxine Jones did an outstanding job. Thank you, Maxine. Fanny Taylor, however, weaponized her privilege as a Sumner woman, white woman, to inflict harm on the innocent people of Rosewood, giving a false testimony of assault against my uncle Aaron Carrier that incited a lynch mob led by her husband, James Taylor. A history clock also used, is used to measure the Jim Crow period of violence authorized by the KKK mobsters where the hate narrative never changes and where violence turned violent in 1923, decimating the town of Rosewood, Florida with more than 400 KKK members in attendance said or stated by the Gainesville Daily Sun. White men oath read KKK member for life. However, at the urgent cry for help from the Rosewood people during the massacre, one white man knew he had to break rank and serve the people he represented. Therefore, Sheriff Robert Bob Walker worked beyond the call of duty, putting humanity above hate. He possibly reflected on a biblical lesson and stepped out on faith, remembering the passage, go down Moses, way down in Rosewood land, until two train conductors, William and John Bryce, to help you let my people go. Sheriff Bob Walker further sought white city key allies to accompany him to remove the Rosewood survivors to safety. And they obliged, knowing they were putting their family at risk if the KKK discovered it. So Rosewood, a majority black developing town, was acquainted with their neighbors in Sumner, working together at the Sumner Sawmill, the same Sumner Sawmill, and living in harmony with respect for each other in segregated quarter row houses. However, some chose the KKK oath over humanity. I have been struggling for years to help people know that Rosewood lives mattered, even before Black Lives Matter came to the force of our collective consciousness. The Real Rosewood Foundation is comprised of a nonpartisan and multiracial body, and we stand to honor the history of Rosewood, Florida, in the memories of the victims and survivors of the 19th. 23 Rosewood Massacre. As such, we deeply value intersectionality and coalition building across our communities, across our communities, regardless of color. Differences. And we are working towards peace, healing, truth, and reconciliation. Two accomplishments I can articulate in honor of my Rosewood aunt, the Rosewood Historical Marker, wherein I call Governor Jeb Bush office daily until they consented, and the Great Floridian 2000 plaque that hangs at the train depot in Archer, where she exited in 1923, day four. I'm an advocate for justice, and I serve on several social justice committees and educational task force. It has been nearly 100 years, and nothing has been done generational to change the educational course to teach Rosewood history in Florida schools. My goal is to build a Rosewood Museum in Archer, Florida, on the same 29 acres of property where the school teacher was born and grew up. 
Mom's words of comfort and courage live with me today in her song of truth written by her in 1995. And I believe at age 93, she would have wanted you to know that she was not biased in the scripting of this song that I'm going to sing for you, only two lyrics, but you will know that she was an all right girl. Ain't I woman? Yes, she was. But today is so special because my congressman, my friend, Ted Yoho, has stood in the gap for six years declaring he would help me with my dream, build a Rosewood Museum in Archer, Florida. In 2019, he went on C-SPAN and declared my Rosewood history, my story, proudly. He was glad to share that story for four minutes. It's in the archives if you want to look it up and read it. And I appreciate him for what he did and what he has done. And again, in December on 2019, he wrote a proclamation for Rosewood because we celebrated January 1, 2020 in Rosewood as Rosewood Day. He was not able to attend, but he sent that proclamation that will hang in our museum, <laughs> for real. He believed in my passionate drive to promote and preserve the Rosewood history, and I believe in him because he's real. Thank you, Congressman Yoho. Thank you. And I want to dedicate these two non-biased verses to you from my mom's song. But before I do, I want to thank the other participants, Dr. Hayden, Dr. Jones, Attorney Hanlon, and Mrs. Johnson, I believe, for your participation today. And lastly, Congressman Yoho, this is my mom's song dedicated to you. <laughs> the city key train conductors were told to pick up in Rosewood. Standing by the tracks with the lantern, his young school teacher stood, waiting in desperation to carry out the sheriff's plans. Rounding up the hidden survivors to board the midnight train. The sheriff and the store owner worked around the clock. Oh Lord, informed the train conductors just when and where to stop. Pick up the men, women, and children who were hiding out and bring them to Archer, Florida, traveling the same old route. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> well, as I told you, Miss Lizzie is a force, and uh, yes. to be fighting this since you were five years of age shows mm -hmm. the drive, the passion, and dedication you have. And uh, thank you for uh, singing that and dedicating it to me, but for, just for singing it and uh, just showing to people. And um, has uh, Miss Johnson joined us? I uh, believe she, there she is. Hi. Hey, Miss Johnson. Uh, we already read your bio and introduced you, but uh, I was a little bit premature in that. So without further ado, if you would go ahead and address us, that would be great. Division of Library Information Services as part of Florida's Department of State. And our main mission is to collect the uh, published and unpublished history of Florida for researchers past, present, and future. So I know we provided to Ms. Norfleet some of the, um, the documents and items that we have in our collections. Um, and it's exciting to think how maybe we could help Ms. Jenkins as she's moving forward in this uh, beautiful dream of the museum in Archer and, and how we might be able to partner in that way. Um, 
So, and I know, um, like the Library of Congress, we serve the folks and, and have collections that are here for people to use, whether they're Floridians or not. We have um, items that we're glad to share with folks who are interested in history. Are there other particular questions or, or ideas or? Well, that, uh, that's a period right now. And, um, you know, just to bring you up to speed, this is some, a project we've been working on. And I sit on foreign affairs and I've uh, been on that for eight years. And what I see around the world is just a canceling of cultures. Like we feel free to ask a question. What I would remind people is it is 1240. And I think we're supposed to be off at about one o'clock. And so uh, succinct questions and then uh, 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 a good answer. <laughs> And so we'll open this up. Who wants to go first? Raise your hand. And uh, Brian, uh, are you going to moderate this, Brian? Uh, yes, I, I can. Uh, Dr. Hayden, you have a question? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, really, uh, Ms. Jenkins, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, and even in my family, we have um, uh, generational trauma. Uh, yes. From, that mm -hmm. happened in uh, Helena, Arkansas. My mom's older brother was killed. Everybody in town knew it, uh, but they couldn't talk about it. Yes. And she still talks about that. Could you talk a little bit more about that generational trauma and how it affects you? That was your favorite aunt. Yes. But you know what? Before I, uh, Brian, I can't see anybody. Can you all see me? Yes. Yes, we can see you perfectly. I don't see anybody. Hmm. What do I need to do? Uh, let me try to fix that for you. You should have, if you go to your cursor at the very bottom of the screen, there should be a start video. Oh, oh. Lord, I've lost you. <laughs> <laughs> but we can still hear you. Oh, okay. We can still hear there you, you are. So that's okay. Yeah, just speak to okay. us. We see you just fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, how has it affected me? My life. Rosewood is my life. And when I tell you my life, every day, every day I, I walk on Rosewood, every day I think about Rosewood. My mom passed in 1997, but Rosewood is still here. She wanted peace for her sister and healing. And it's, it's, it's who I am. I'm working to get this museum and that will help me to heal. It will help her to heal because believe you me, Dr. Hayden, I think she is still somewhere in this room. Yes. where I am working because I can feel her energy and yes. when I talk about Rosewood you know go out and make speeches I come home and I have to go to sleep right. it weighs heavily on me it's like I don't have a life but I have a good husband because he understands before my mom passed she said take care of my baby and make sure she continues the Rosewood research, make sure she does not attack anybody. And, and when she said attack, don't attack the white people because they did not create Rosewood. And I don't, as ugly as the story is, uh, Dr. Hayden, I tell it positively. And we laugh. I, we laugh about what happened. Okay. And I always... Uh, enjoy telling it, but it's not easy. I want people to know. I want it to stop. We know that it's not uh -huh. going to stop, but we want to be able, like uh, Congressman Yoho said, leave something positive for the next generation sh so that they will know. Put it in the school. Right. And I have one board member who is a mayor. He has written a letter and his goal is to start it off in the Florida schools. And boy, his ambition is really powerful where we are going to take this. And with help coming from you all, we know that we are on the right path. I know that's a long answer to your question. That's what I wanted but, to hear. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's not easy. No, and I don't know if people realize the generational trauma that happens to African-American families and it have happened and how it affects people. Yes, it's called the burden of truth. Yes. <laughs> it's the burden Especially of truth. Especially when it's not revealed. 
and you have to exactly hold and when it's ignored yes yes but I, I feel much better especially today i'm so happy i was so scared <laughs> about being you know to, to come before you all but i'm happy it has happened and knowing congressman yoho he is going to make sure we take it to the next level and i appreciate that so much for pulling this together for putting us together today thank you again next question <laughs> <laughs> you're natural would you all like to see would you all like to see a picture of uh, the teacher and her husband yes let me, let me see if I, if I know what to do. Hold, hold one minute. <laughs> while, while she's doing that, is there any questions? There you go, right there. Can you see it? Who is that? Oh, wonderful. wonderful. That's my aunt, Mahalda Gussie Brown Carrier, and her husband, Aaron. I'll be darned. It's a beautiful What year was that? I'm thinking in the 30s. It was after Rosewood. Okay. Wow. And, and how Lisa, long? Was, how long did she live? Oh, excuse me. How long did she live after the? Twenty-five after? years of misery. Mm. They stalked her. They. Uh, she moved approximately fourteen or fifteen times, and the mail, the postal service, would open her mail, and they knew how to keep in touch with her. They opened her mail, and, and I have, I have a, a letter in my book, wherein they scratched through her mailing address on the envelope and wrote her correct mailing address. Okay, so they, they were really bad. They really harassed her. And Wrong no one knew. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes. Why? They, they, why, why did they They didn't up? want her to talk. They didn't want anybody ah. to tell what had happened. Okay. Because you know what? Bottom line, and Dr. Maxine, I don't know if you are aware of this. They said uh, two whites were killed, but the blacks said more than two were killed. Because when they came into Rosewood, when the mob came to Rosewood on day two, not knowing that Sylvester Carrier had gone out. They sent messages that they were coming. So Sylvester Carrier and Sarah's son had gone out and recruited his friends and his cousins to come to Rosewood, bring your gun on Tuesday night, which was the second night. I don't remember if it was Tuesday night, but I think so. And they were there waiting for them. And the, and the KKK out of town guys coming into Rosewood, not knowing where they are going with guns coming to kill, they were met head on. Okay, with gunfire. And they also didn't know how to travel uh, rut roads. And I don't know if any of you know what a rut road is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes. They had to travel. Yes, a rut road. And once they got down those rut road cars behind each other, they could not turn around. It was a rut road. So they had to jump out and run back to Sumner if they you know, were able to. But we understand from the inside, and when I say inside, Sylvester and his people, men, that there were several killed, several whites killed, and they did not want the, the message to get out. So when they showed in the movie that there was a mass grave, and my mom was 21 when this happened, and I told her about it and took her to the movie. And my mom said, if there was a mass grave, it was white men. Because I cannot count for the five blacks that were killed in Rosewood. And I took my mother to see the movie and my mom gave wow. it a seven. Because she remembered, she had a mind, you know, for the static memory, eighth grade education. So I took her to see the movie. So I said, mom, on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate the movie? She said, oh, I give it a seven. <laughs> and she was the speaker that night after the premiere that they showed for us. Mom was the speaker. So somebody wanted to know, well, why uh, a seven? seven. 
Yeah. She said, well, the two most important things that happen, it let you know, the, that the movie brought forth, it let you know that Rosewood happened. And it let you know that white women will lie on black men. And the entire movie went, oh, they didn't believe she was going to say that. Mm -hmm. Mom was smart. She picked up on why the, she said, well, I'm 93 and I'm going to say whatever I want to at my age. I have earned that right. That's True. right. She said it. So it's a lot I didn't tell you, but I, I do have it in my book that's coming out hopefully soon. I keep saying that, but I keep adding to it. <laughs> and Miss Jenkins, are you recording or just some of the things like you're telling us now? Have you recorded those? Like a oral yes. history? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And that question was from? Uh, Carla Hayden, the Library of Congress. <laughs> okay. Collecting the let, oral the, histories. Okay. Let me ask you, were you there in 1995? At the library? No, no, no. Okay. No. All right. I took My a picture with somebody else. I was there. <laughs> okay. But Adrian, uh, Adrian Cannon. I don't know if she's still on the line, but um, had was at the library. Okay, so it may have been with her because I brought some of my Rosewood information and filed it there. Did um, you go to the copyright office? Yes, I did a copyright. Yes. Okay. So that, so we would probably have it, um, depending on the format, uh, the Copyright Office does retain originals for a period of, of, of maybe a decade or so, but we, you, you would definitely have the copyright registrations. Were these oral histories and articles or? Articles more? and uh, a book. And a book. And, and some book. songs. That song? I brought that and song. Songs. Yes. Was yes. your book published? Yes. Yes. So, so it's possible that we have a copy in the library's collections because at, at that time, the practice was for the library to retain at least two copies of what was placed on, on copyright deposit. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. going to make a special trip up there. And we'll check it out. Adrienne, I know she's making notes to make sure she follows through on that. Okay. I've got a question for Amy Johnson. Um, um, somewhere where I read in here, there were, uh, you have grants that could possibly use, is this a project that it could be used for? Um, specifically, uh, Congressman Yoho, are you thinking about the, the Rosewood Museum? Oh, the museum. Um, certainly through the Department of State and our Division of Cultural Affairs, our Division of Historical Resources, if there is a library associated with the, um, with the museum, then certainly there would be funding um, through the Division of Library Information Services. But certainly my sister divisions here in the Florida Department of State would definitely have uh, some opportunities and potentially within uh, the Division of Library Information Services also. All right. How can I get um, Miss Jenkins associated with you that where she can follow up with that? Because I'm sure there could be a there would probably be more most likely a library associated with that. Sure. Yes. Sure. Sure. Um, so if I can just um, and it it may be that Miss Norfleet could you know give me an email or an email introduction sure. or Congressman Yoho. I mean I'd be more than happy to help make connections. Absolutely. Glad to. All right. Good enough. And um, Amy, uh, oh, excuse me, I just want to, Amy, as you're doing that, possibly an IMLS grant, yes, Institute sure. of Museum and Library Services, that's a, a federal agency that gives to libraries and museums. Museums, And right. I know they do a lot, so that would be a connection if you could have uh, Ms. Jenkins connect with them. And the new head of it is Crosby Kemper, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, a librarian, so from Kansas City, I believe, so. Yes. Perfect. Absolutely. I'll be happy to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. I can Absolutely. Tell that, that librarian organization is a tight knit group. Oh, we're group. a tight group. We're yeah. a tight group. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. And Hanley. Jenkins, do you know Altravis uh, Barnes? Barnes? Yes, Alvin I do. Nor? 
Oh, God. She's a yes, family I know her. friend. She's a family friend and from Tallahassee. Okay, I hear you're from Tallahassee, too. Florida A&M. Sorry, Dr. Jones. That's okay. <laughs> I like Florida A&M. <laughs> <laughs> Florida Memorial. That's right. Florida Memorial University is where I'm from. Okay. Dr. Um, Jones, do you have any questions for Mr. Hanlon? No, I don't have any questions. All right. Mr. Jones, or Hanlon? Well, I always like to ask Dr. Jones uh, to describe uh, what that hearing was like, because it was really, uh, it was tough uh, for particularly Dr. Jones and for uh, the, the other people that uh, on the professor's team. So why don't you share a little bit of that, Maxine? Well, I, I wondered what I had gotten myself into, uh, for sure. Um, it wasn't, we had a lot to do in a very short period of time. And I think under the circumstances, we did, we did, a, we did a decent job. But I didn't know that, that, that there would be hearings and, I, and that we had to be, be a part of those hearings. I just had absolutely no idea at all. I mean, that wasn't what I had signed up for. Um, and, of course, not everyone was on the same page. Um, there were letters to the editor that did not support uh, the government giving money to the survivors of Rosewood. And it was, um, looking back on it, I am glad I was a part of it. I'm glad I had the opportunity to meet the survivors. Uh, these men and women who were very stoic and just very poised and to give them the opportunity to tell their story. That, that, that was the beauty of it. But it wasn't what I, a shy, reserved uh, you know, professor, had signed up for. Um, but I survived. And I got a chance to meet all those people. And I got a chance to meet you, too, Steve. I mean, we have a friendship that... Uh, this longer uh, than 20 years now, I guess almost 25 years now. So a lot of good came out of the uneasiness uh, and the unpleasant parts of it. The only, the only part of it, your words there that I disagree with is when you said you did a decent job. You did a stunning job. Uh, Under the circumstances, thank you. <laughs> Rosewood, the Rosewood bill uh, would, would never have happened without the uh, the work that Dr. Jones and her team uh, did it was truly uh, remarkable, and um, it uh, drove uh, that together with the hearing and the testimony of the Rosewood survivors uh, drove the passage of that bill. And if we're going to have similar successes uh, uh, today, those stories are going to need to be told. Uh, that way, both uh, in terms of uh, the writing, and there's a lot of writing going on now, and in terms of the um, the oral history, uh, that um, in large part, you know, the country um, has um, still um, not come to terms with. I'd like to add that, uh, Dr. Jones, had it not been for you and your research and your team, we would not be talking about Rosewood. We wouldn't. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Wow. Uh -huh. and, wow. And, and thank you. And I want you all to know that I wrote the script for the historical marker. However, I was told... <laughs> that oh good good job but it has to be written by dr maxine jones so she <laughs> i was glad that you used some of my information but she put the final touches on it i appreciate that dr jones i'm glad i could help mm -hmm. it shows the power of research and scholarship yes right yes. behind me is um John Hope Franklin's book. Yes. Uh, and talk about, a quiet, mm -hmm, talk about a quiet presence. And Dr. Jones, it seems like you really 
exemplify that. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. And let me kind of just maybe try to summarize this of why this is important. I think all the words that were said. <laughs> now, who's that? That's my mother. I'll be darned. My historian. Oh, can we see? Um, why this is important. Um, not just here, but other nations around the world. And I'll explain that. The actions and hatred that caused the scars of the past generations, they need to be acknowledged, number one. Yes. And people that emboldens, emboldens, uh, embolden people to come out in other incidences where they don't deny these things happen, like the KKK, the threat of that. You know, uh, we want that, that portion of our history not forgotten, but behind us so that we don't have to live through that or nobody has to live through that fear. If not, the resentment builds up and it becomes a powder keg that will, without understanding, it will explode at some point. You know, slavery happened in this country. There's no denial. We had a civil war to end that and to bring it to end. But then we saw different, different administrations um, create segregation. We saw politics get played. Then we went through the civil rights struck, um, 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 fights of the 60s. Then we went through the integration, which I was a part of. I was involved in race riots and in high school and got suspended twice and it, it's out of a basis of ignorance not understanding and then what will happen is like today we see today in this nation we see blm black lives matter absolutely and it's a good cause but then we see other groups hijack those good causes and causes more resentment and more division groups like antifa and we can go on but what i see too is on foreign affairs, we get visited by other countries and there's a big rift between South Korea and Japan. They don't like each other. And it's because of what happened generations ago in World War II, where the South Koreans were made prisoners by the Japanese imperialists and then forced their men to work in the factories, uh, slave laborers. They forced the women to be uh, comfort women. They were prostitutes, or not prostitutes, they were um, uh, used as sex slaves, and it was issued by the government of Japan. That happened not in, I wasn't there, I wasn't involved in that, I didn't make those decisions, but that fight is going on today to where it's kept those two countries apart, and with that division in those countries has weakened our alliance in the Asia Pacific area between us, South Korea, and Japan. These are fights that we can't right that wrong I don't think there's enough money to right any of these wrongs other than atonement, acknowledgement, and then the forgiveness has to come. That way we can move forward as a nation. That way we can move forward with our next generation to understand this so that they know the importance of not repeating these things and bring people together, you know, because at the end of the day in this country, we're all Americans and uh, we can't deny what has happened. We have to just make sure uh, we move forward. And Dr. Hayden, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you staying on the whole call because as oh, I was, oh, yes. you're only <laughs> going to be here for a few minutes. And uh, I know well, this whole thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Professor Hanlon, for your work with what you've done to bring this out. And we find out through the great friends that uh, Dr. Jones was the uh, uh, impetus behind this. And uh, mm -hmm. Um, Lizzie, I can't tell you how much I appreciate our friendship. Yes, same here. Your passion and dedication to this. And Miss Johnson, you. thank you for your help too. And did I leave anybody out? But I'm thinking Miss Cannon. Adrian Cannon. Yeah. yeah, I forgot Miss Adrian Cannon. And That's thank all you. Right. Uh, anything that, uh, I always throw this out at the end. If there's things like Dr. Hayden that you think of that say, you know what, it's like that, um, that grant you were talking about. If there's anything like that, you say, yes. you know what, I thought about this. Let's talk to these people yes. about that. Um, um, Professor, or Professor Hanlon, same with you and everybody on this call. You know, because you'll leave here saying that that was good, but if we could do this, I'm open for all suggestions. You have, you have my uh, <laughs> um, 
my um, permission to say you should have done this, you should have done this, or maybe you should do this. I'm okay if you tell me and direct me. After all, I'm here, you know, to serve you guys. So I want to thank you again, and uh, I'm going to sign off. I've got a plane to catch. And um, thank you again for everybody's participation. Does anybody else have any comment or uh, final thoughts that you want to say? We just, we're just pleased to be part of it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I am super happy, super pleased. And I would like some uh, contact information from the Library yeah. of Congress. Can you yes. answer? Okay. I'll, Dr. Hayden, I'll send around some contact information for the participants on here. For this. Oh, that would be great. Okay, so good. Professor Hanlon and Dr. Jones, I want to connect with you okay. two, too. Thank you. Thank you all, and I appreciate it, and you have a wonderful day. You too. Right. Safe Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. I did not get anybody. I don't know why. Okay.